Hello, my name is John Ruth and I've written a book. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about it, why I wrote it, what the title means, and uh, give you a glimpse of what's coming. Um, I was born and raised on a farm, a 200 and some year old farm on the Clemens Homestead, 29 miles north of Philadelphia. And to live on a farm is to live on land. And to get, well, in my case, get to know 110 acres through which flowed the northeast branch of the Perkyoman Creek, which is a tributary of the Schuylkill River, which is a tributary of the Delaware River, which flows into the Atlantic Ocean. In my 40s, I began to develop a kind of an irrepressible interest in where on the map I had been born and raised and where I was living. My cousin Jake Landis and I grew up on the farm together and we related to the creek. And when there were uh, there was an overflow and some fish were stranded. We pretended we had caught them. We were formed in the wombs of our mother, mothers who ate food from that land. We had a relationship to it. We lived working that land. I plowed this field and I remember with my dad on the other tractor, disking as I was plowing. And now I can recall the, him hearing him sing. We sang on the land. He was on the other tractor. We were adjacent to another farm taken from the original Clemens homestead. That land is now a thickly settled uh, tract of homes. Uh, developed by a developer from the city. When we bought that land, when we could pay for it, we were given a patent, which is an open declaration that we owned that land. The people who had lived there before, the Delaware Indians, of course, uh, would un not understand that language or that transaction. In Franconia Township was the land of the Hagee homestead. And that homestead had a man who cared about the history of the land and he drew a map. And that map, across from what later became Mopac industry, indicated the place of an Indian grave. The Indian Creek flowed into the branch of the Perkyoman, just adjacent to our land. In 1962, an eight-year-old boy started searching that land and he found a piece of, he thought, and it was, Indian lore. Today, Lee Hallman's house is full of evidence of his searching fields, not only right around my homestead, but for miles around. Next to us were the Zigglers, here they're husking corn, and on their farm, they found a trove of artifacts, hundreds in fact, every time after rain fell on plowed fields. A man in Hilltown Township named Harold Hockman kept finding things. The paper showed a picture of him, but no one knows today where his treasures went. Tim Moyer found things also along his place on the branch. It was a heavy uh, crop. Bill Delp had a farm, which is today a corporate headquarters. And on that farm, Washington's troops gathered at Toa Menson in 1777. Tim Moyer found a cannonball there, or someone found it 
there and gave it to him. And then on the adjacent Creeble farm, there was another set of findings. And that's where they found this arrowhead, as we call it. Over at, in Hilltown Township, Chuck Strauss kept finding things along what we would call the 113 corridor, right where the Mincy Trail headed north toward where the Munsee or the Wolf Tribe of the Delaware lived in the Lehigh Country. Here in Lower Southwark Township was the Maxitani Trail. Just a bit of evidence remained yet when I saw it in the 1970s. Today, much of the topsoil, as we call it, of Lower Salford, Franconia, Hatfield, and the adjacent townships is piled up or pushed aside, and we'll never find anything there again. Abram Harley was a Dunkard, and he lived along the Indian Creek, and he listened yet in the eight, late 1840s, and he heard people talking about Indians living along what we call the Indian Creek. And he, living uh, there, told about what the Price has remembered. They had a tra tradition that their immigrant forefather, Daniel Price, had married a Lenape girl. In 1930, I went to Paraguay on a filmed job, and there I saw Indians. This is what they looked like when the Mennonites arrived in Paraguay in 1930. But this is what they looked like when I was there, and I found that they were friendly. I talked with some boys, I talked with uh, some men, and a friendly woman, and uh, I came home wondering why our Indians had not stayed with us as they stayed with the Mennonites who didn't come there until 1930. We moved to the little village of Vernfield in 1971 and only then found that we were again, that, my, that is my wife and I and children, we were just backed up against the Branch Creek, only a mile or two up from where I had been born. Then we moved again, back to the homestead, only four or 500 feet from the branch in the house I was born in, and my wife made a beautiful frock tour wall piece there with the verse from the book of Psalms, the earth is the Lord's. Only later, after we had put all the initials of my four parents who had owned it for seven or eight generations, did I think about the fact we had no indication there of the people that had owned it for thousands of years before we came. My cousin, Walton Hackman, a farmer from Hatfield Township, had served as a conscientious objector at Red Lake, Ontario, and he told me that instead of going to the mission church there on Sunday evenings, he went home with the local Indians and listened to their stories, which he said went back to creation. He brought slides home of what he saw there, and he told me that when I saw the bulldozers come to our farm, I f could feel what the Indians felt. Realizing that I didn't know much, I traveled a lot. I got to Switzerland and saw where my ancestors came from in the Emma River Valley of Bern. <clears throat> I traveled to Lancaster County, visited where the Conestoga Indians lived and then were massacred in 1763, the remains of them. I traveled all the way to Oklahoma. And there I met the family of Touching Leaves Woman. She had been in my community and I hadn't realized it, but I missed her by three weeks. Her husband gave me uh, some ears of corn of maize to bring home. Then as 1992, approached, which was the 500th anniversary of Columbus's dis discovery, if you want to call it that, I thought that we should recognize that time, and my wife made another frock tour in which 
I had her insert some statements of friendship by the Lenape Indians of my community. We invited Dee and Annette Ketchum. At that time, he was a ceremonial chief of the Lenapes at Bartlesville in Northeast Oklahoma. And uh, they came north to visit us on that anniversary. We took them to the village of Veracruz, or where there's a Jasper Park, as, as it's called, uh, where the Indians would find Jasper points. I was given by D a feather. You know, the Indians called William Penn feather, and both the Iroquois and the Lenape had their own names in their language for Penn, which was feather. That eagle feather is precious, and it hangs in our living room today. I'm only joining the effort to think a little harder and think a little more with a little bit higher resolution about what happened when we took over this land. You can see it now in many good works of fiction and even poetry, especially a poem by Daniel Hoffman in 1981. You can Google it. I would like to recommend Erwin Stutzman's fiction. He came to here to Branch Valley and uh, I helped him find maps and chronologies. He wrote an excellent fictional account of some of the goings on in the French and Indian War. And then there's the work of James Landis. Very extensive, very carefully researched. It's fiction, it's fictionalized, but it's based on uh, absolute solid uh, scholarship with maps. I would recommend his work. You can Google it, James Landis. I was helped in writing my book by my son, Phil. Even as a boy, he was interested in learning uh, history. When we moved to Vernfield, he depicted himself afloat on the branch. He became familiar with a painting by a Souderton artist of the branch, and he even commissioned by a painting by Bill Bach of a depiction of the passenger phenomenon. Well, Phil became a writer himself. He's written over two dozen historical books, starting with material around here. He finally, he, he did a North Penn portrait, and in it he has a picture of local Pennsylvania Dutchmen playing at being Indians. He edited a memoir I did a few years ago uh, called The Branch. It took very expert work, and I do believe there's a few on hand here this afternoon, if anyone would like to get them. It's a memoir in pictures based on my life uh, here and then in my travels and including my connection with uh, looking at the uh, Indian history of the region. My publisher, Michael King of C the Cascadia Publishing House, has his studio in an old horse barn along the branch too, just several miles upstream. You know, we are very proud of Edward Hicks's repeated paintings based on the idea of the peaceable kingdom. They're very friendly and uh, uh, they, give, they make us look very good. A more realistic painter was a Swedish man named Hesalius, and he gave us uh, pictures almost photographic-like of two Lenape uh, headmen. Tish, Tishakonk, or Tishkohan, as he called him, and uh, Lapa Winzo, who lived along the uh, Lehigh uh, at present-day Northampton. Was I really aware of the Schuylkill watershed I lived in, like the Indians had it in their minds? I was started to give talks about the Indians, and people listened, and I began to realize that I didn't know much. Did I know that the Schwenkfelders had given money to the Quakers to make peace with the Indians? Did I know that my minister, my Mennonite minister, my predecessor 
at the Salford Mennonite Church, also was involved sending money to Israel Pemberton and trying to give gifts to the Indians to find reconciliation in the violence of the French and Indian War. No, I didn't know that. I did. But I did travel to Oklahoma again in 2006, and there, listening to a Mennonite minister and Cheyenne peace chief, Lawrence Hart, I heard the story of how George Custer, whose ancestors came from Mennonites at Skipak and who could still speak Pennsylvania Dutch, had slaughtered the Cheyennes on the Washita, including Black Kettle, the chief who came before Lawrence Hart. While there, uh, Lee Hallman came along with me and we visited the Lenape Center near Bartlesville there in Northeastern Oklahoma. Uh, and we met Jim Rementer, a man grew up at Ambler, but moved out there to Oklahoma and was taken in by a Lenape family and has today become the promoter and the organizer of a tremendous online Lenape talking dictionary. I traveled also to Bethlehem to see the graves there of the Moravians, who were special friends of the Indians, including uh, gravestones with Indian names, unique uh, in Pennsylvania. I traveled out to an oak tree that was big already then, as now it's over 400 years old, that is sacred to the Indians, and they will still gather there, and they will drum in remembrance. I traveled up to the Senecas in New York to their museum. I saw many markers. There was the marker of the slaughter of the Jacob Lerois, or Jacob King family, near Shemokin or Sunbury at Penn's Creek. I saw another marker for Indians, uh, where Indians killed Mennonites in uh, Berks County. And I saw a marker in Bucks County for the walking purchase, 1737. Hmm, that was interesting. And the marker is still standing there at Ottsville. But I had a remarkable experience there in 2011 when I found, when I went with some Lenape Indians to look at it, it elicited a remarkable uh, response from them. I wasn't the same after that. I went down to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and did some research. I considered the role of William Penn and found I could learn a few things about him. He was a remarkable man and we should hear from him. He's not to be easily explained. He was a disappointed man, but a man that we should hear from again in our time. I looked at his collected works, but here not everything was in them. The Historical Society of Pennsylvania had a copy of a letter in which he told his secretary, James Logan, here come the Palatines, they're Mennonists, they will neither fight nor swear. Treat them with gentleness and love so that they will send over a good description. I knew who was on that boat. Gerhard and Ann Clemens. Henry Culp, the first Mennonite bishop, lived at Skipak. Well, <clears throat> I started writing my book and I had a title now made up of two quotes. One from a famous Indian chief of the Lehigh group, the Munsee group, Tidioskum, who, when was asked, really, what are you Indians complaining about? He stamped his foot and he said, this very ground was taken away from me by fraud. And where did I get the second part of my title, this, this uh, uh, crooked affair? Well, I got it from James Logan, who was the secretary of Penn. When he heard 
how the surveyor and speculator had sold land without proper legitimate deeds and spent the money and just handed in the Mennonites' promissory notes for what they hadn't paid up front. Logan said, that's a crooked affair. Now, I have to think about the fact that the land I celebrated on, that I lived on, that I inherited, from the Lenape point of view, and even from William Penn's secretary's point of view, it was a crooked affair. What am I celebrating? I want to understand, not to condemn, not to get mad and have some big ideological chance, simply curiosity. What really did happen? Dave Peters is interested in the whole project of having a fresh encounter with this fascinating and uh, peaceful and wise and compassionate and memorable man, William Penn. And Dave came to our homestead and sent up his drone to get a picture of it. Dave edits on uh, in his studio on this very grounds. He attends the Salford Mennonite Church next to the Clemens Homestead. He's been at Pensbury. And who is he making this uh, documentary with? Abby Abildas. She, here, she is with Dave and Kathy Peters. They are in the process of creating this very significant documentary. They came to our house and there Abby spoke from our living room underneath my wife's proctor. She spoke about William Penn and his legacy. And she spoke to folks listening over in New Zealand. There's a message to go forth from what from our encounter with the land, with the Lenapis, with William Penn. That's what my book is about. This book is a musing. It's built not on anger or ideology. I know about the document, uh, the doctrine of discovery, and I sure don't like it. But the book was written out of curiosity. What happened? Did the Lenape say something? They sure did. What did they say? When did they say it? Where did they go? in the next 80 years after William Penn was here. That's what the book is about. It's, there's not a word of fiction in it, and uh, it's not written by a professional historian. But it asks this question, can we look at what happened here from our Lenape friends, descendants, from their point of view? Or as we're better informed, with our growing, digitized, instantly available data. We can even see McGoxon's signature on the land when he gave the Perkioma to William Penn for two coats, four pair of stockings, and four bottles of cider. Looking at it that way, can we ask, since that's what happened on this very ground, which can also look like a crooked affair, what would be an appropriate response? Thank you.